Hello there and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood and you are watching W News, broadcasting live from the Al Arabiya News headquarters. These are our top stories. The head of Hamas in Gaza confirms the killing of leader Yahya Sinwar by Israeli forces after Israel releases drone footage of his final moments. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the conflict with Hamas will continue as US President Joe Biden says it's time to move on and reach a ceasefire following Sinwar's death. And Donald Trump and Kamala Harris head to Michigan today in a bid to woo voters in this all-important key swing state. Welcome. Well, in a televised address, Hamas's Khalil Chaya has paid tribute to the memory of the, quote, fallen martyr, Yaha Sinwar. The head of Hamas in Gaza describing Sinwar as, quote, steadfast, brave and intrepid, stating he sacrificed his life for the cause of our liberation. We mourn the great leader, the martyred brother, Yahya Sinwar, Abu Ibrahim, Hamas political bureau chief and commander of the Al-Aqsa flood battle. The hostages will not return unless the aggression against our people in Gaza stops and Israeli forces withdraw from the besieged territory. Additionally, we call on Israel to release the Palestinians held in its jails. Well, this comes after Israel released a video from an Israeli drone showing the Hamas leader sitting in a bombed building before throwing a piece of wood at the drone shortly before he was killed during a routine search for Hamas members. His body's identity was later confirmed with DNA records. Our correspondent Sarah Coates is in Tel Aviv for us this evening. Sarah, just give us uh, the main takeaways from what we've heard from Israel's military and government today about the killing of Sinwar. Hello there, Rosanna. What we can tell you is that there is a high-level meeting happening right now, not far from where I'm standing. That is at the IDF headquarters, the Curia, right here in Tel Aviv, as Israel's top-ranked security officials go over the events of really the last 24, 48 hours and decide what happens next. Now, what we can tell you is that this happened by chance. That is according to the Israeli military. We do know that an infantry brigade was on patrol in the Tal al Sultan area, that is down in the southern end of the Strip, an area inside Rafa. They then engaged with a number of Hamas fighters on the ground and it was only after these fighters were found to be deceased that these troops realised that one of these bore a very striking, a very strong resemblance to the leader of Hamas, Yahya Sinwar. Now, we do know, according to Israeli authorities, that his body was then taken to Israel. This actually happened on Wednesday, we do need to add. Taken to Israel for forensic testing, DNA testing, testing on the teeth. And what we do need to remember here is that Yahya Sinwar was imprisoned in Israel from 1988 to 2011, <coughs> so the Israelis certainly had a lot of information with regards to his DNA, his biometrics and that sort of thing to actually determine that this was him. But it is certainly something that it is being celebrated here in Israel. And once again, right now, a very high level meeting happening not far from where I am as Israeli officials try and decide on the next steps, Rosanna. And, and Sarah, are those celebrations, as you're saying there in Israel, obviously, for the killing of Sinwar, uh, you know, whilst that might be among the military and the government, is that also being felt in the public? Are pe do people feel safer? Is there a sense there of safety or fears of retaliation? I wouldn't say at all a sense of safety, but really this is something that Israelis have wanted to happen for a very, very long time. Yaya Sinwar has had an X on his back for many, many years. He was Israel's most wanted man. 
He was seen as the architect of the October 7 atrocities and he's really been the one that the Israeli authorities have been trying to track down and kill. Now, shortly after this announcement, Rosanna, we actually saw IDF officers in certain parts of the country pulling up cars on the road and trying to hand out sweets. Uh, so certainly uh, there was a lot of jubilation with regards to the public. People were happy that this happened, but not all of them, because we do need to remember that there are still 101 Israeli hostages that do remain in the Gaza Strip. And right after this announcement from the Israeli military yesterday that came out to say Yaya Sinwar eliminated the family members of these people, they took to the streets. They were calling on the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to use this opportunity, to leverage this opportunity, to do a deal now and to bring these people home. Now, separately, I did mention this high-level security briefing that is taking place right now. Well, there's also a separate meeting that's set to happen, and that is with regards to these hostages. Now, what we've been hearing from the United States and other uh, global players, really, is that they're trying to use this opportunity also to leverage a deal to get these people back, to leverage a deal to end the war in Gaza. But right now, the rhetoric that we are hearing from Netanyahu and also senior Hamas officials, they're not budging from these positions. Benjamin Netanyahu says the war will continue, troops will continue to fight, while senior Hamas leaders have said that there will be no release of Israeli hostages until there is a full withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip. So it certainly is a very difficult situation. And we have heard from the US President Joe Biden just over the last couple of hours. He was speaking in Berlin and he said it's going to be much easier to find sort of a diplomatic situation or solution, I should say, uh, between Israel and Hezbollah than it will to end the war in Gaza. In terms of retaliation, if there is more to come, how is the government preparing for that at the moment? Well, in terms of retaliation right now, the retaliation that's being spoken about here on the ground is Israel's retaliation to Iran for that unprecedented ballistic missile attack that took place on the first of this month, we have to remember that there were around 200 ballistic missiles shot into Israel by Iran. Israel is promising to retaliate to that. It's basically just a matter now of when and what it hits. Now, Biden also spoke about this on his visit to Berlin. He said he's aware of when this will happen. He's aware of what Israel will strike, but he wouldn't elaborate any further. Now, we are hearing that the Israelis have given the Americans guarantees that they will not go after oil facilities, they will not go after nuclear facilities, and they will instead go after military targets. But in saying that, it is an extremely tense time here in the region. Uh, Israeli forces have been told to stay on very, very high alert because the Iranians have been saying that if they are attacked, there will be no red lines and they will strike Israel back. So it really is being seen as sort of a vicious cycle of violence with no end in sight. And once again, it is a region bracing for what comes next. Rosanna. Sarah Coates, our correspondent in Tel Aviv this evening. Thank you. Well, staying with this story, let's get more now with the former U.S. national security advisor and former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton. Uh, John, always good to see you on the show. Thank you. And I want to start by asking your reaction when you first heard the news about the killing of Sinwa yesterday and the way in which it was done and discovered. What were your thoughts? Well, I thought it was a good day for the world. Uh, this, this is a vicious, barbaric terrorist who has uh, finally met his fate, better, better late than never. Uh, and I think it uh, points to the very significant uh, damage that Israel has done to this particular proxy for Iran uh, in the Gaza Strip. I think there's more work to be done. I don't think there's any reason for a ceasefire. I think Israel should continue to uh, try and achieve the objective it set out immediately after October 7, which is to uh, eliminate Hamas as a military and uh, political force. You think that Netanyahu should proceed with that strategy, not get around a negotiation table and talk about ceasefire yet? 
ne negotiate with whom and for, for what? You want to end the conflict in Gaza? Why don't people ask Hamas to surrender? Do you think that's a possibility? I mean, so the alternative is continue militarily flattening and trying to weed out every Hamas terrorist in Gaza? Yeah, it's how you win World War II. You demand, uh, as the United States did, unconditional surrender from Japan and Germany, uh, and you fight until they agree to it. Uh, and that's obviously a very big departure from what current U.S. president in his final days of his presidency, Biden, is saying today, asking for that ceasefire, asking for Netanyahu's cabinet to work towards that. So do you think the U.S. government's on the wrong track? And it has been for over a year. They have not acknowledged uh, the real strategic reality in the Middle East, which is this is not uh, a Hamas war against Israel. It's not a Palestinian war against Israel. It's an Iranian war against Israel, of which Gaza uh, forms one front. Uh, and that's why, really, I think the decision Israel is now confronting uh, as to how to respond to the second ballistic missile attack uh, against its territory from the territory of Iran on October the 1st, what they're going to do about it. Just to put this in context, the October 1 attack by Iran was the largest ballistic missile attack in human history. In uh, Berlin today, I believe he is, Joe Biden, speaking to reporters, somebody asked him, a reporter asked him, do you know uh, how Israel is going to retaliate and when? And he said, yes and yes. And she said, will you tell me? And he said, no and no. Do you think it's true that Biden does know how and when Israel is going to retaliate? Uh, I'd be surprised, actually. Uh, I don't buy the argument that they have uh, necessarily agreed not to attack the nuclear and oil facilities. I think uh, the nuclear program is a military program, and indeed it's the most dangerous program, not just for uh, Israel, but for the United States and as a matter of uh, counter-proliferation policy, really dangerous for the world as a whole. In terms of the possibility of ceasefire elsewhere in Lebanon, Biden quite confident that that's something that might be achievable, but acknowledging it will be harder in Gaza. So do you think he, he does understand that it is going to be difficult to negotiate with Hamas? I think he's dreaming. I don't think you can negotiate with terrorists in good faith. That's not the way they are. And uh, I think it's the systematic destruction of the terrorist threat uh, that's necessary. Will it require negotiation with Hezbollah in order to ensure a ceasefire in Lebanon? Well, a after their stockpile of uh, missiles is destroyed, the CIA and its public fact book uh, obviously published long before this conflict uh, broke out, estimated, this is what they say publicly, estimated that Hezbollah had up to 150,000 missiles. So I think uh, if I were facing that terrorist threat, I, I wouldn't be satisfied until the threat had been eliminated. I find it interesting speaking to terrorist experts in interviews over the past few weeks, talking about whether it's possible to do what was done with the Islamic State with ISIS in terms of weeding them out root and branch and almost getting rid of the organization for good. Do you really think that's possible with Hamas? Sure. Why shouldn't it be possible? You know, if you look at what happened in Germany after World War II with an aggressive denazification program, uh, having eliminated uh, really the, the Nazi infrastructure, uh, Germany's now gone almost uh, 80 years without a resurgence of Hitlerite uh, Nazism. So I think if you have the will and the resolve, and I think most importantly, if the Gazan residents see a world without Hamas's intimidation, and I think it's coming into view, uh, then, then you can uh, have the prospect of uh, Hamas truly being eliminated. And I think people telling you how hard it is uh, haven't lived under what the Israelis lived under on October 7th. It, it obviously presents a very difficult challenge, uh, post, say, elimination of current day Hamas, not to have generations of radicalized young people who saw their families bombed and killed uh, for years in Gaza and elsewhere in, in the region. Uh, do you think it really is possible to get away from that? I'm talking, you know, when you're sat in the Middle East and speaking to people who may uh, have experience or family in Palestine uh, or Gaza or Lebanon or anywhere else at the moment, the feelings are very strong about the way that Israel has conducted this. Do you think it's really possible for people to see outside of that? Sure. I think they have to ask themselves why they allowed Hamas to use their families and friends as human shields. 
the war crimes that have been committed in Gaza are entirely Hamas's responsibility. You know, the West has spent a couple hundred years trying to separate uh, innocent civilians from combat. Hamas's whole strategy is to put innocent civilians at the center of the conflict as human shields. That's the barbarity. And people in Gaza should ask themselves, is that the kind of regime they want to see imposed on them again? Is it going to require more U.S. support for Netanyahu to carry through his military aims in Gaza if he's going to continue the war in the way that he says he is, the way that you would advise him or support him in doing? Is it going to require yet more U.S. military assistance, of course, the, the sending of sort of anti-missile defense systems and things like that, but also U.S. troops? I don't think it will require U.S. troops, although we do have troops on the ground that the Biden administration has put there to help man the uh, anti-missile defenses that uh, that we've given. Uh, but look, this is uh, what Israel's doing is defending uh, the world against terrorism. They are systematically dismantling two pillars of the terrorist proxy network that Iran has set up over a period of decades. Uh, I think the U.S. could do more uh, to help Israel. I think we could do more to dismantle the Houthi terrorist network. And I'm very pleased that uh, in the past uh, day or two, the Biden administration has sent B-2 bombers with what are called massive ordnance penetrators, that is to say bunker busters, mm. to break up the arsenal that Iran has provided to the Houthis. You know, it's been a principle of American foreign policy since we were a country to advocate freedom of the seas. And what the Houthis have done, except for their favorites like uh, uh, tankers carrying Russian oil, is they have closed one of the world's most vital sea lanes, the Suez Canal uh, Red Sea Passage. And I think we ought to open it. And I think doing that means cutting off the Houthis' supply of rockets and drones uh, from Iran uh, and eliminating whatever capacity remains in Yemen uh, for use against international shipping. And the first time those B-2 bombers were used since 2017, showing the uh, significance clearly of what was thought imperative. Former U.S. National Security Advisor and former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton, thank you. Thank you. Well, for another perspective on all of this, I'm now joined by the brother of Or Levy who was taken hostage by Hamas back on October 7th last year. Michael Levy, thank you very much for making time to speak to us this evening. Um, just talk to me first about what your reaction was when you heard the news of the killing of Yaha Sinwar yesterday. Uh, at first, it was a shock. Uh, I couldn't believe it uh, on, the first, on the first second when I heard. And my second feeling was uh, hope. Hope that uh, now that this uh, evil person is out of the picture, the one who stopped all of the latest deals, uh, now we might have a chance to see the deal and get the hostages back. In terms of the chances of sealing a deal, some people clearly want it. The United States being one there, Joe Biden, the president, they're pushing hard today to try and get a, a deal for the hostages and a ceasefire. But Benjamin Netanyahu, your prime minister, actually not seeming to want to take that route. How does that make you feel? Well, honestly, I, I, I don't think this is the case. I think... Uh... That uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, the Israeli government knows that uh, there won't be a better chance than this one. And this is probably part of the negotiation. Uh, but I know that the, they understand that uh, there won't be a better chance than this one. So you have hope that Netanyahu and his cabinet are going to try and work out a way whether it's militarily or diplomatically, to get the hostages back within the coming weeks? I think it's, it has to be combined, as always, because uh, unfortunately Hamas uh, don't want to negotiate uh, without it. I uh, would love to get uh, the hostages back and end this war, but uh, first... They have to come back and we have to find a way to do it and the international community has to put more pressure on everyone involved including uh, the Qataris and the Egyptians to make sure that Hamas is actually getting a deal a serious one 
In, in terms of the ability to negotiate with Hamas, um, sources actually telling Al Arabiya that Yaha Sinwar, recently before uh, his killing, uh, rejected a deal which would have allowed him and his family to leave Gaza in exchange for releasing the Israeli hostages. When you, when you hear that, what's your reaction? Um, this kept happening again and again and again. Just in a uh, rejected uh, deals in the past uh, almost 13 months now. And the fact that he's out of the picture means that uh, we have a chance to find someone who can uh, end this and uh, maybe, maybe we'll have a chance uh, for a better future for uh, both people in Gaza and in Israel. Do you feel uh, like you have enough support from the international community to get the hostages, get your brother home? Do you feel like the world is still paying attention? Um, the fact that uh, my brother is still a hostage after uh, more than a year now means that uh, we didn't get enough support. But I think now we have a real chance to get my brother and the rest of the hostages back. And I think the international community has to do whatever they need to force from us to release them and seal a deal and end this war. Brother of as simple as that. Brother of Orr Levy, still being held hostage. Michael Levy, thank you very much for joining us. Well, President Biden has also said that NATO must sustain its support for Ukraine until the country can win a just and sustainable peace. He made the comments during his current visit to Berlin, where he's been meeting with key European allies. The president also using the visit to discuss the war in Gaza. From Berlin, Trent Murray's got more. On what is expected to be his last visit to Europe while in office, President Biden is welcomed to Germany by Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Dear Joe, thanks again for taking the time for this visit. It is a strong signal of our transatlantic unity and of our friendship. While the pair put on a show of unity, these talks come at a time where uncertainty exists over the direction of travel on Europe-US relations. The prospect of former President Trump returning to the White House has unnerved some European capitals, especially on the issue of military aid to Ukraine, as Trump says Europe needs to do more and the US less. Biden sought to allay those concerns by calling for continued support. America and Germany are the two largest supporters of Ukraine in its fight for survival as a free and independent nation. As Ukraine faces a tough winter, we must, we must sustain our resolve, our effort and our support. Well, there are undoubtedly some very difficult conversations taking place in that building right now. UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer and French President Emmanuel Macron have flown in to join this summit. We understand the simmering tensions in the Middle East are high on the agenda. After Israel confirmed the death of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, President Biden said he hoped it could mark a turning point in the war on Gaza. The death of the leader of Hamas represents a moment of justice. He had the blood of Americans and Israelis, Palestinians and Germans and so many others on his hands. I told the Prime Minister of Israel yesterday, let's also make this moment an opportunity to seek a path to peace, a better future in Gaza without Hamas. And I look forward to discussing Iran. And as President Biden departs back to Washington after a whirlwind 24-hour visit, it's likely for some of these European leaders it will be the last time they see him while in office, undoubtedly wondering what lies around the corner as a combative US election campaign looms large over the future of the transatlantic relationship. Trent Murray, Al Arabiya News, Berlin. Well, let's get some of the other day's news now. North Korea has shipped 
1,500 special forces troops to Russia's Far East for training and acclimatizing at local military bases. According to South Korea's National Intelligence Service, they'll likely be deployed for combat in the war in Ukraine. The agency is saying they used facial recognition technology to identify North Koreans' offices in Donetsk region supporting Russian forces firing North Korean missiles. Reuters reporting North Korea shipped artillery rounds, ballistic missiles and anti-tank rockets to Russia in more than 13,000 containers since August last year. French Prime Minister Michel Barnier met with Italian ministers on Friday to discuss illegal migration. The two EU members are pushing for stricter border control. Next year, France and Italy planning to create a joint unit to crack down on migrant smuggling networks. King Charles III arrived in Sydney, Australia today on an official tour. It is the first visit in 13 years by a reigning British monarch to the country. King Charles and Camilla will be in Sydney and Canberra over six days before travelling to Samoa. This is King Charles' first foreign trip since his cancer diagnosis eight months ago. And Liam Payne, former One Direction bandmate Neil Horan, has said he is absolutely devastated by the passing of his amazing friend. The 31-year-old fell from his hotel room balcony on Wednesday evening in Buenos Aires after flying in to see Horan perform on tour. The other members of the band also paid tribute to the star online. Police say they are still investigating the circumstances of his death. Well, to the US now, where former US President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris have traded blows again as the race to the White House enters its final stretch. Both took personal aim at the other candidate at different events on Thursday. Watching for us, our correspondent Benji Heyer. I'm a keep running cause the winner don't quit on another rally, another swing state, another swing at Donald Trump. General Mark Milley, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Donald Trump's top general, has called Trump, and I quote, fascist to the core. And it is clear, Donald Trump is increasingly unstable and unhinged and will stop at nothing to claim unchecked power for himself. Ken Langone, Kamala Harris's presence in Wisconsin meant she couldn't attend a campaign tradition, the annual Alfred E. Smith Memorial Foundation Dinner, a white tie function in New York City to raise funds for Catholic charities, a chance to roast your political opponent in person or, if not, on screen. Does it bother you that that Trump guy insults you all the time? Because it really bothers my friends and me. Oh, Mary Catherine, it's very important to always remember you should never let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. Let us recommit to reaching across divides, to seek understanding and common ground. Common ground? This campaign is thin on consensus. The two candidates for president are supposed to exchange good-natured barbs. And you know, we get along very well. I didn't like Biden very much, and now I like him quite a bit, you know. It's... <laughs> and now I say that she's much worse than him. He was a much better candidate than her, actually. And when we hopefully win, dispose of her, I like her a lot. But right now, I can't stand her. It's true. I can't stand her. With the former president deep in his comedy routine material, it was left to fellow billionaire Elon Musk to stump for Trump in Pennsylvania. The businessman has poured money, resources and his endorsement into the Republican ticket. Uh, we want support of the Constitution and the right, to, you know, freedom of speech, right to bear arms. And um, that's what Donald Trump is going to do. So. Time is running out to make the case to voters. Polls are already open in some states and a contest that's still too close to call. Benji Hire, Al Arabia News, Washington. Well, let's get the latest from the campaign trial with our correspondent, Carolyn Malone, who's in Washington for us. And Carolyn, what, what's been the reaction so far today, stateside, to uh, the events of last night, those blows being traded?
Well, one of the also controversial comments that Trump made on Thursday was regarding the starting of the war between Ukraine and Russia. He actually took the blame and put it on Ukrainian President Zelensky and also the current president of the US, Joe Biden. He said it was their fault that the war started rather than the Russian president, Vladimir Putin's fault, which of course goes against the grain of what most people in the United States believe and indeed NATO allies across the pond. And we know, of course, that President Biden is in Germany at the moment doing precisely the opposite, trying to shore up support for Ukraine, in particular because they are concerned that Trump might get into power. And if he does, that could spell the end or have some concerns for Ukraine support, ultimately. Also for, you know, going forward, the amount of money the US spends on NATO and its allies there. So quite controversial comments made by Trump on Thursday on that. But, you know, the president of the United States is already dealing with that, you could say, in Europe. Um, Trump is also aware, and we've seen that in his comments this week, that he really needs to gain the support of more Latin American voters. As Latinos living in the United States, um, whose demographic is crucial to him getting the kind of support he needs. He was at a town hall earlier this week, speaking uh, on a channel that's broadcast bilingually. We've actually seen some reaction to that on Friday with the Harris campaign through some funding support for her, uh, putting out a campaign in favour of Harris in some of the swing states directed exactly to that demographic to Latino Americans, to those who are bilingual speakers in particular. So really critical that both of these candidates at this point really hone in on every one of those individual voters who can make all the difference here. Meantime, a small point, but uh, Trump's press team has been pushing back on reports that, and this was specifically, I think, in Politico, that Trump has been pulling out of interviews because he's exhausted. Yes, I mean, the campaign season is absolutely exhausting, perhaps not surprising that anyone um, would find it tiring at this point, particularly, you know, a, an older gentleman as Trump is at this point. Um, he has been appearing on, on numerous stages. He's been in different places every day. He has been on different media outlets. But what we can certainly say about Trump is he seems to be favouring appearing on the more right-leaning, the more conservative news stations, uh, being more picky about where he appears. Uh, certainly on Friday, he was on Fox and Friends. That's on Fox News Channel. That, of course, is a very uh, conservative channel and one that generally favours him and Republicans. Uh, you know, he's also brought attention to something that he sees as an issue for his campaign when he spoke to Fox on Friday, saying he recognises that what's happened with abortion in the United States has actually hurt the support of women voters for him. He, of course, when he was last in office in the White House, helped to bring into the Supreme Court more conservative judges. They overturned Roe v. Wade, the constitutional right to abortion here. And then a lot of states have had a very harsh stance. What we've seen from Trump is that he's slightly backtracking now on his quite strong views on abortion, clearly because he's recognising that it could potentially hurt him quite massively with 50% of the population who votes here. Well, quite elsewhere, a federal court releasing more evidence in Trump's election subversion case. What do we know? Yes, yeah, so the election subversion case has been run by Special Prosecutor Jack Smith. Now, these are cases um, that have been delayed and delayed and delayed to the point now where they won't happen before the election. And one big ruling that was made also by the Supreme Court earlier this year was that some of the evidence might actually come under presidential immunity for Donald Trump. What we've seen on Friday is 2,000 documents that Jack Smith and his team um, want to use as part of this court case. They've been released more publicly so that can, people can see what this evidence is because they are pushing to have this evidence included in the case. However, there is a chance because of this presidential immunity ruling by the Supreme Court, they actually might not be included in the case. Although, I must say overall, there is one important point here. It doesn't seem to be making a difference to voters. Trump has his core supporters, his MAGA supporters, Make America Great Again supporters. They're going to vote for him regardless. We had a court case earlier in the year where Trump was found guilty um, for business fraud in New York. That really didn't impact the polls as much as we might have thought it would. In these other cases, both the um, election subversion cases and also one from Florida about classified documents, 
they're not going to be happening before the election. So people won't be using that potentially to decide on whether they vote for Trump or not. And even if these cases did happen, a surprising number of people don't seem to mind either way. Our correspondent in Washington, Carolyn Malone. Thank you. To some business news now, workers in Italy's automotive sector have marched to the streets of Rome, demanding more work and better conditions. Strike was called by the three main automotive unions in the city and comes amid rising tensions between global automaker Stellantis and the Italian far-right government. China's economy, meanwhile, grown by 4.6% year-on-year in the third quarter, the slowest pace recorded in one and a half years. The latest figures coming as authorities have started to sharply increase stimulus measures to try to ensure the economy meets its growth target of around 5%. Russia's President Vladimir Putin saying BRICS countries will generate most of global economic growth. Speaking ahead of the BRICS summit, he said the group's total GDP growth is forecast at 4%, while G7 states are expected to grow 1.7%. Netflix announcing it is to raise prices in some countries. The company adding more than 5 million subscribers in the last quarter, but signalling slower growth. Ending September with around 282 million subscribers and a $2.4 billion in revenue. Netflix shares rising nearly 5% to 720.75 US dollars in aftermarket trades, which is slightly more than double the price from a year earlier. Your sport headlines now. And in football, Kylian Mbappe is back in training with Real Madrid after Swedish media reported he's been investigated by police over an alleged incident. The accusations follow a recent visit to Stockholm. Mbappe took to social media to deny the reports, calling them fake news. Manchester United manager Eric Ten Hag has criticised the media for spreading what he called fairy tales and lies about his future. He faces intense pressure going into the international break after a streak of five losses, including a humiliating 3-0 home loss to Tottenham. After the match, former England midfielder Jamie Redknapp telling Sky Sports he thought Ten Hag was out of his depth. Before we go, a reminder of our top stories here on Al Arabiya News. The head of Hamas in Gaza has confirmed the killing of the group's leader, Yaha Sinwar, after Israel released drone footage of his final moments. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying the conflict with Hamas will continue as US President Joe Biden says it's time to move on and reach a ceasefire following Sinwar's death. And Donald Trump and Kamala Harris head to Michigan today in a bid to woo voters in this all-important key swing state. Well, that's all the time we have. Coming up next is Riz Khan. And at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, join Tom Burgess-Watson for Global News Today, a roundup of top international news with exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision-makers.